Today on In Your Face Anatomy, we're going to get into chapter one, talk about some of the basics, uh, the terminology, all of the stuff that we need to know to do well. I'm Dr. Davis. This is Ka, the children's python. Let's get into it. All right, this is our chapter one, what to study uh, for anatomy and physiology. We're going to get into the basics and some of the terminology, some of the specific things that I'm looking for, so pay attention. Here we go. So the first thing, what is anatomy and what is physiology? Well, anatomy comes from uh, the Greek, and it means a cutting up. So we're cutting things up to look at it. So with anatomy, we are largely looking at the structure the structure. So I could say like, this is my uh, humerus bone, or this is my deltoid muscle, or this is my median nerve going down my forearm. With physiology, it translates to mean relationship to nature. And with it, we are largely looking at the function. The function. So uh, I could say, this is how my humerus bone is formed, or this is how my deltoid muscle contracts. This is how my median nerve conducts an impulse. It's all about the function. So with anatomy, we're looking at the structure. How is it made? With physiology, we're looking at the function. How does it work? So those are the basic first two definitions that we absolutely have to be familiar with. Next, we're moving into the levels of organization. So I've got my 10 levels of organization, and you have to be able to list these 1 through 10. So I've kind of got that laid out for us here. 1 through 10, you have to be able to put those in order uh, because we're going to use these to build the more complicated structures. So with my subatomic particles, what am I looking for for subatomic particles? I'm looking that you understand that these are my protons, my neutrons, and the electrons. So these are my building blocks. These are the simplest structures that we're going to be looking at as far as my levels of organization is con concerned. Subatomic particles, protons, neutrons, and electrons. Now we're going to take these protons, neutrons, and electrons, and we're going to combine them to build something more complex, and that's how we build our atoms. So atoms are just a collection of all of the protons, neutrons, and electrons uh, that we've built. Um, These guys are built from subatomic particles. Um, then we're going to take these atoms that we've built, and we're going to combine them together to make something more complex, and that's how we're going to build our molecules. So we've got lots of different molecules uh, to consider. I could say H2O, water. Everyone knows H2O is water, but what that's telling me is that it's two hydrogen atoms and one oxygen atom that have been bonded together to create this water molecule. I could do carbon dioxide, CO2. Two car or one carbon, two oxygen atoms combined together to make this molecule. I can do methane, which is CH4. So I've got one carbon and I've got four hydrogen all bonded together to create this more complicated molecule. Now I can take these regular molecules and build them together, start adding them together to build what we refer to as macromolecules. So there's four major macromolecules that you need to be familiar with. We've got proteins. We've got carbs, carbohydrates, we've got lipids, and we've got nucleic acids. Those are my four macromolecules. More on those guys coming up in the next chapter. Then we've got organelles. So organelles are, are little particles that have a specific function within the cell. We've got lots of different organelles, and they all have a very specific job to do. So these guys have specific functions inside of the cell, in the cell, which gets us down to the cell itself. So with the cell, what I want you to understand is the definition. A cell is defined as the basic unit of structure and function. So here we're putting anatomy and physiology together where anatomy was uh, structure, physiology was function. We're pulling it all back together for the first time. Basic unit of structure and function. Tissues. 
So tissues are just layers of cells working together, essentially is what they are, layers of cells working together. And we got lots of different kinds of tissues we could choose from. We got muscle tissue, we got nervous tissue, um, bone tissue, cartilage tissue, uh, glandular tissue, all kinds of tissues uh, th that we could choose from. But now we take these tissues, these uh, layers of specialized cells that are working together, and put them together, and we're able to build some specific organs. So I could say like the lungs, the liver, or the intestines are all just various types of organs that we can use uh, as examples for the organ system. So now we can take the different organs, combine them together to create the individual organ system itself. So there's several different organ systems to choose from. I could say like the uh, muscular system or the lymphatic system or the endocrine system or the cardiovascular system or the skeletal system, lots of systems. If we were to put all of the similar organs together and that gets us down to the organism which is the human. And that's what we're really interested in this class. What is the structure of the human for anatomy and how does it work with physiology? So with my levels of organization, first, you have to be able to list these one through 10 in order and understand that I have my subatomic particles, my protons, neutrons, and electrons, and I put, use those to build atoms. And then I use my atoms to build my molecules. And I use my molecules to build my macromolecules, macromolecules to build the organelles, Organelles come together to form the cell. Cells come together to form tissues, which become organs, which becomes the organ system. Uh, and finally, the organism. So those are my levels of organization. So somewhere in that process, somewhere between the subatomic particles and the human, the organism itself, life happened. Our subatomic particles are not alive, but the human absolutely is. So somewhere in that process, life occurs. So let's look at what are the requirements for life. There are five that we want to be familiar with. So that's the next thing that we need to know for this chapter. What are the five requirements for life? We've got water, food, oxygen, heat, and pressure. And I've given a brief definition of each of these of what I want you to know. So with water, we, want, we need to know this is the most abundant substance in the body. And we use water to help control our, or regulate our body temperature. Food. So food supplies energy for raw materials, for building new living matter. Oxygen, oxygen we use to release energy from our nutrients. And so we have to have oxygen, yes, for breathing, but then we take that oxygen and we use it to help break down those nutrients uh, and food particles down into the, the little molecules that our body needs, specifically ATP. Uh, and we can then use that energy that we've just released from the nutrients to help drive metabolic processes. And these two go hand in hand. Heat is defined as a form of temperature in the environment, not to be confused with temperature. Temperature is a measurement of heat. Heat is a form of, uh, of energy in the environment. Temperature is a measurement of the heat. And then pressure. So pressure is defined as an application of force on an object. We have a couple different types of pressure that apply specifically to our body. For instance, atmospheric pressure. That is uh, the, the weight of the air, and that comes into play in inhalation and exhalation in, in that breathing process. We got hydrostatic pressure. So that is going to be um, kind of on the uh, similar lines of blood pressure as well. We're using hydrostatic pressure to help keep blood inside of our vessels so blood is not leaking out all over the place. So let's know the five requirements for life, be able to list those for us, and a brief definition for each one. The next concept for chapter one is homeostasis. So homeostasis is defined as maintaining a stable internal environment. What does that mean? Well, that means all of the stuff that's kind of running in the background of your brain, the stuff that you don't have to think about, releasing the hormones or controlling the blood pressure, releasing the digestive enzymes, absorbing the nutrients, all of that kind of background stuff that's running that your brain's in control of without you having to think about it, that's going to fall under homeostasis. It's your brain kind of running everything in the background to maintain a stable internal environment. 
that we have three parts with homeostasis. We have a receptor, which is going to provide information about a stimulus. So it doesn't matter what the stimulus is, we're going to pick up that information from our environment and take it to our, 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 our nervous system for that receptor to kick in. Then we're going to compare that information that that receptor just picked up and compare that with what we have in the control center. So the control center is also called a set point. Control center slash set point tells what a value should be. Then we're going to uh, elicit an effector. So we call them uh, effectors because they have an effect. They actually do something to make a change. That's why we call these guys effectors. Like muscles are effectors. You touch a hot stove. You're going to pull that hand away. That's your effector, that, that, that pulling back. And its job is to an elicit a response, preferably elicit a response that is going to change uh, whatever's wrong with our homeostasis. So we have two ways of controlling homeostatic uh, homeostasis, two uh, different types of homeostatic control mechanisms is the term they like to use a lot. Homeostatic control mechanisms. We're just talking homeostasis. And with that, we got negative feedback. Or positive feedback. So negative feedback, the big thing you need to know about negative feedback, it turns itself off. Turns itself off. As conditions return to normal, it's going to shut itself off, and then things are back to good. So let's say um, temperature. Say we get too hot. So we know that normal body temperature should be 98 0.6 degrees Fahrenheit or 37 degrees Celsius. 37 is the same as 98.6. Remember, water freezes at 0 degrees Celsius. Water is going to boil at 100 degrees Celsius to give you a, a scale there. So let's say we get too hot. So that temperature gets above 98.6. We'll stick with the Fahrenheit because that's what we're used to. Say we get up to 100 degrees Fahrenheit. 100 degrees Fahrenheit. Now what's going to happen is our Blood vessels are going to open out, uh, open up. They're going to vasodilate, and we're going to move more of that blood away from our vital organs, our heart, our liver, our lungs. We're going to move that blood away, move that heat away with it to kind of keep this area as cool as possible. At the same time, we're going to start sweating. Start sweating, and as we're sweating, we're releasing some of that heat out into the environment. As our body temperature comes back down and we get back down to that 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit, our blood vessels return to their normal size and we stop sweating. That is negative feedback. It turns itself off. We stop sweating as we cool down. Or say we get too cold. So, so let's say we drop down to uh, 96 degrees Fahrenheit and now we're too cold. So we vasoconstrict those blood vessels. We make them smaller to trap that heat, trap that blood all around the lung, the liver, the heart, all of those core really important organs. And we start to shiver. And as we shiver, heat gets released as a waste product. Every time a muscle contracts, heat gets released as a waste, weight, waste product. And the same thing is true when we shiver. So we start to shiver, and then we warm back up. And as we get back within that 98.6 degree range, our blood vessels return back to their normal size, and we stop shivering. That is negative feedback. It turns itself off. That's the key thing to know about negative feedback. turns itself off. Positive feedback... Oh, change issues further change. Change stimulates further change. So with positive feedback, we're moving away from normal conditions. And so I use the example of childbirth for positive feedback. So this is where a woman goes into labor. She starts those contractions. And at first, they're not too bad. And they're spread out pretty far apart. But as we continue through this labor process... Uh, those contractions become more and more intense and they become more and more frequent as we get closer to this process. And they will continue until that process is complete. We've moved away from the normal state with positive feedback. Negative feedback turns itself off. Positive feedback change is going to stimulate further change.